beautiful song. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here and for lending your voice and your musings to our community. Thank you. And what a lovely meditation. And um, yeah, so I'm going to wade into some terrain here. We're in a series which we've called The Great Questions, and I thought sooner or later we'll get around to the question of God as long as we want as long as we might want to avoid it. It's one of the great questions, I suppose. And um, yeah, so I'm doing a couple weeks in a row on the question of God, and if you missed last week's, you might want to check it out um, in, in a way. It's, I don't really like this word because it, it, it kind of annoys me too, but it, it was quite um, where I think I was trying to touch upon the mystical in a way. And that's challenging terrain. And I was reading from Merton, this famous uh, quotation, there's no such thing as God, because God is not a thing. So, um, yeah, and uh, I don't need to do last week's talk. I'm here to do this week's talk. So maybe I don't need to say more about that. But that's the place I wanted to start the conversation. It's from trying to wrestle with these texts from the great saints and mystics and let it inform the way in which we hold the question of God. And I think it matters. That's partly what I want to say here at the beginning. It matters whether we reject God or accept God or think about God as a thing or no thing or reality with a capital R um, or we don't. The question of it is not going away. It's partly what I want to say. It's, it's one of the great questions. Let me put it another way. How do we relate to what's ultimately true? And every new generation, new era, has new ways of wrestling with that. And what we know and don't know about the universe and about the world uh, continues to bring up the question of what do we wrestle, how do we wrestle with what's ultimately true about the world, about reality. So today I want to try to, although I can tell it's going to be a challenge, um, based on our, our pre-talk, which you, you should definitely come to from time to time, we have some really interesting discussions before the gathering, and all kinds of great things come up, and I really get a sense for um, different people's perspectives, and I really appreciate that. Um, but I want to talk about God as an archetype, and so that means we have to wade into some Jungian stuff, meaning Carl Jung, who I've been reading for, I don't know, eight years or so, ten years maybe. And that does not make me an expert, even though I've been in a, a Jungian analysis. I'm not the, the one doing analysis. And I went to graduate school for different sorts of things than depth psychology. But it is a great passion of mine, and, and it has greatly informed the way I think about life and about the world. And, and, and Jung is like one of those secret agents he he, is, he infects the way much of our culture thinks about the world. Like when people go around saying, I'm an extrovert, or I'm an introvert. That's all Jungian stuff. So um, his, the, the way in which he's f informed the conversation around, around the psyche is important. So I want to try to introduce you to the question of God as an archetype, really, today. And a little bit of what perhaps Jung meant by that, because that was one of his claims, that God is an archetype. And so your question is, what the hell's an archetype? <laughs> and, and I'm mentioning that because what kind of terrain are we going to be in today? We're going to be in the terrain of how the psyche relates to reality, not so much the metaphysical terrain, although that, that is metaphysical too, I suppose, but I'm not trying to make ultimate claims about the existence or the non-existence of a deity right now. I'm just sort of saying, God sits in the, in the psyche as an archetype, and collectively. That's one of the claims of Jung. So we're going to wrestle with that. So since we're on the, the and I've got six points, and I'm going to go kind of fast, because I want to get to the sixth one, because that's going to be the best one. Um, and maybe another way to hold today is, is I'm just trying to, to begin a conversation not trying to seal the envelope here and put one of those little kingly stamps on it 
you know, and say we've, we've said what we need to say about it. I'm trying to op open, open us up to a conversation, so it'll be interesting to see what comes up during talkback. Okay, so here's claim number one or idea number one I want to challenge you to wrestle with a bit. I will get to the readings here, but in a minute. So first of all, I've said this once, at least once before here, but it's another Jungian claim that within each human being, we have a religious instinct. That's what he claimed. We have a religious instinct. Now, what, what counts as an instinct? You know, fight, flight, freeze, sex, shelter, food, religion. Right? That's, where he, that's where he situates the religious instinct that deep in the psyche. Now, what evidence do we have of that? Because he was also a scientist. He said, look around. There's not a culture that we know of that doesn't posit some relationship with the beyond, with the transcendent, with spirit, with God, with gods. Where does that come from? And he says, it must be a kind of instinct, an instinctual way of relating to the world. Here's a more simple way of saying it. We have an instinct toward meaning. Do you feel how that's slightly different than the instinct is there's a God? The instinct is toward meaning. We don't know why we're meaning-making creatures. And that's what he called the religious instinct. Now, some people reject that and say, no, no, we don't, we don't have that. And then sometimes they reject that with a lot of religious zeal. <laughs> So it's, um, it can be a bit tricky to deny that such a thing exists. Here's a, an image for it. This is not Jung. This is me, sort of put, just putting some images to it, like an inner seeker of meaning. I sometimes even feel that about things like nihilism, like there's no meaning, there's no meaning. I can feel that the inner seeker of meaning is at work. Otherwise, why the hell would you even care to even say that? If there's no meaning, you just wouldn't even bother to bring that up. But if you say it, it's like there it is. It wakes up. The religious instinct is activated. That's point number one. Okay, point number two. Humans experience what Jung called the numinous. He actually borrows this from a German theologian named Otto, but the word numinous is Latin, and it means... Technically, it means to wink, <laughs> but it's like the universe winks at you, you know, that kind of thing. But I'll, be, I'll, I'll broaden that out to say we experience the numinous. Our consciousness is confronted by things that confound us and give us a sense of awe or wonder, or sometimes even dread, too. It's like we're going along with our day, we're in charge of our life, and then something comes in, the numinous, and disturbs that and broadens our horizon. And so in a very general sense, that would be a religious experience, being very general. So humans are prone to religious experiences, and they have a religious instinct. So what are they going to do? They're going to try to make meaning out of those confrontations with consciousness. I know that sounds fancy, but I don't really mean it fancy. I just mean like, there I am going around doing my thing, and something so profoundly overwhelms me, I don't just say, well, you know, well, it was about the same thing as some dumb thing I watched on YouTube. No, I'm, I'm going to want to make meaning out of that. And there the religious instinct wakes up when we have religious experiences or experiences that broaden our, our sense of who we are, our consciousness. Here's a funny example <laughs> about the religious instinct and this impulse toward meaning. Okay, we're going to go back in time. And let's say we've all agreed that there's no God. Okay, there we are. We're like, all right, there's no God. And it's the 1960s. And for some reason, we find ourselves in Manchester United Stadium with 80,000 people. Right, there we are. And John Lennon is up there, and he's playing his song, Imagine No Religion. And it's, it's old school. We don't have cell phones, so we all have our lighters out, you know, <laughs> like this. Right? And we're crying. We're so profoundly moved by this. That's a religious experience. That's the religious instinct waking up. We're literally having a religious experience singing Imagine No Religion. And don't tell me that that's not, that wouldn't happen, you know. It would happen. So the psyche is prone to these kinds of things, religious experiences and um, 
So here's my first quote of the day. Let's look at David Foster Wallace here. This is one of my favorites here. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. He's basically saying we have a religious instinct and we're oriented toward meaning and we're going to end up worshiping that even if we claim we're not. The compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan mother goddess or the four noble truths or some inviolable set of ethical principles or values is pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. Okay, he's talking about the contemporary conundrum we find ourselves in. And ironically, David Foster Wallace is saying, I'm going to paraphrase and he might correct me, but you might as well choose something big than something small. You might as well allow something like Allah or Yahweh or the mother goddess to confront your consciousness and challenge you and give you a larger system of meaning in which to orient your own religious experiences or your lack of religious experiences or your own religious instinct. Do some shaping and forming. Otherwise, what you end up worshiping will eat you alive. Let me give you an example. Gambling. It will eat you alive if the religious instinct is activated, because that's what's happening with addiction, really. The orientation toward the transcendent, I want to transcend my own life, that's really at the heart of all addictions, and I'm, I'm a highly addictive person. We all are. But we want to transcend our lives, and we know those things will eat us alive. Wouldn't you agree? So he's saying, okay, we might as well get down on our knees and say, all right, we have this orientation, and to what am I ultimately worshiping? Okay? Pretty interesting. All right. Let me see if I'm ready to go to point three. I guess point three, yeah, comes out of this quotation a bit, which is something like this. What, uh, well, maybe here are a series of questions that we could wrestle with. What are we in service to? Uh, what do I have to learn? This is things you might want to carry if you acknowledge you have a religious instinct or you're going to worship something. What am I in service to? What do I have to learn here? Um, where and how have I been wrong? Uh, is there something greater than my own personal experience even or something greater than myself to which I might align? These, see, feel how these are worship-oriented questions? And I'm not, again, making a claim whether there's a, there is a God or not, a thing up there, an old man in the sky or something. Um, what happens when we have a, a spiritual, a religious experience? What kind of system do we run that through? Because we need a system, I think. Because a system can help expand what we might mean by these things. Otherwise, you end up just having your own personal systems. And those personal systems are, can, tend to be a bit myopic. I'll give you kind of a funny example. This, just, I'm, I, this is a composite. I'm, I'm making up a person, although I'm not, okay? I'm, so uh, imagine someone might some, say something like, you know, um, believing in God is silly. You know, like a, like a dude up there doing things and, you know, like pulling the, you know, puppet, puppeteer strings. And I don't believe in that God. I don't believe that God exists. I'm just here on earth, just doing my thing. And, and that's just all, you know, massive projection onto, onto the skies. And I'm more sophisticated than that and so forth and so on. And say, okay, cool. Well, what'd you do last weekend? Well, you know, during the solstice, I went out and I powered up my crystals and I just feel that now I'm able to truly manifest uh, energies in the world and those are being reciprocated um, by, by the energies of the cosmos. And, and you might wonder to yourself, well, I thought we just rejected all this divine stuff and now we just have our personal experiences. So I, I'm, I'm bringing that up because when people say they're spiritual, oftentimes they will reject the systems, and the systems should be criticized. But in its place, just becomes a kind of privatized uh, collection of random experiences. 
which also can't be questioned in our very postmodern world. Like, what am I supposed to say to that? I mean, would it, would it be allowed to say, um, that sounds like made up, you know? There's no way your crystals gave you power for manifesting energy based on the solstice. I, I, I don't, I didn't check that. We don't like that because although we have no problem saying, you believe that God answers prayers, you know? How silly. It, we just live in a funny culture when it comes to a conversation about a larger system like David Foster Wallace is saying that we then relate to. We want, especially in America, we want everything to be privatized and unable to be questioned. Okay. Um, let me just add one thing that's not really a part of this uh, 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 Jungian conversation necessarily, and that has to do with Darwin. So one of the interesting things about Darwin is that, as far as we know, his motivation was religious, not non-religious. He wanted to go to seminary, and he didn't go to seminary. He went on this big journey, and, and what was he wrestling with? Well, the way things are, the way things are. And it definitely challenged the religious dogma and systemization of religion of his day. Wouldn't you agree? But that's interesting that his motivation was religious. Like, what do we mean by God? Remember, that came out of Merton's mouth. What do we mean by God? That's a uh, this doesn't make sense. And I'd like to suggest something, just kind of as an aside. To land on an island and notice that, or two islands, that the beak of a particular bird was shaped by its environment and adapted over vast stretches of time and to, and to take a look at another island and see that vast stretches of, of time were involved in shaping the beak uh, the beak differently based on the environment led um, Darwin to a kind of, what we, we even say, kind of conversion to the way things are, to the world. And the, I would like to suggest, purely from the mind of Kent Dobson, that the religious instinct is also activated in, the, in that kind of thing. Like, it is, in a sense, a kind of religious experience. And I might even say evolution as a process can have that kind of effect, have that kind of numinous touch point rather than just cold rationality, but a numinous touch point for what is real. Now think about what is more profound. Let's say 6,000 years ago, God got bored and he was like, I don't know what to do with the next six days of my life, so how about, boom, this, all right? Or a 14.5 billion year old process of which began with compressed matter to such an infant, infinitesimal degree that we can't even fathom it with the human mind, and it began to expand from there. Now, I don't, that kind of thing can be just as much of a numinous kind of, of encounter to, to our consciousness and lead to a kind of religious experience and lead to a system in which we then read and orient the world as anything else. Am I making sense just about how the psyche works and how it relates to the world and how we understand the world? You're good with me so far? Okay. I might even say any modern spirituality I think has to take these things seriously, sort of like the science religion thing. I think it, they have to be uh, singing in harmony, you know, you might say, oh, you're talking about religious experience? Let's talk about the brain. I say, yes, we should talk about the brain. They're, they're not, they're both. And I don't know where the line is exactly. All right, number four. Seems promising we're going to get to six points at this point, although I'm not sure. Okay, now, now that was all set up for God as archetype. So what is an archetype? Now, the simplest way of putting it is an archetype is a pattern. It's a pattern that seems true and extends over vast stretches of time. And it gets constellated in certain images, but the images are somewhat relative. Jung is saying, but the pattern is real, and it's, it's alive in a way. And it, I don't want to get into the whole theory of co the collective unconscious, but he would say it rests in the collective unconscious. We inherit these patterns. And these patterns function and operate in the world in a certain way. I'll give you the big ones so you know what I'm talking about, like father or mother. Now, it's also true that you have a father or mother, but over vast stretches of time, 
the human psyche begins to orient with, toward those things and orient to the pattern behind the individual expressions of those things. It's why all of you could say, without too much thought, so-and-so was a good father, so-and-so was a bad father, or so-and-so was a mixture. What is the thing behind the thing that we're relating that stuff to? What he's saying, it's not just cultural indoctrination, but a pattern exists, and that pattern is the archetype. Father, mother, king, warrior, lover, I'm just naming some, hero. That if, you, if they're pre-linguistic, he actually says, but, but, but if I were to go to every culture on the planet, there would be a way that this culture and the individual human psyche would relate to the pattern itself. And the pattern becomes, in a way, a kind of judge of reality. We seem to want to relate our present mother-father with something larger. Does that make sense? And that larger thing is the pattern itself. He says, God is also an archetype. It just happens to be one of those things. And we want to relate our experience to this larger, more mysterious pattern. Okay, now I'll read to you the quote. This is from Jung here. My views about the archaic remnants, quote, which I call archetype or archetypes or primordial images, it's another word he uses for it, have been constantly criticized by people who lack sufficient knowledge of the psychology of dreams, because he says we dream in archetypes, or there's archetypal material in dreams, and of mythology. The term archetype is often misunderstood as meaning certain definite mythological images or motifs. But these are nothing more than conscious representations. Such variable representations cannot be inherited. The archetype is the tendency to form such representations of a motif, representations that can vary a great deal in details without losing their basic pattern. Okay, that's a pretty fancy way of saying if God is an archetype, then the God image is going to vary wildly across cultures and experiences, and time, but the basic pattern, there's something coherent or intelligent about the basic pattern of it. Not that they would all agree, but the individual images are different. So you don't inherit the individual image, like the old man with a beard in the sky. That's an image that is relative. He's saying there's something even behind that, and that's what he calls the pattern, the God archetype. Have I made sense, at least kind of theoretically, what I'm saying? And we don't inherit these things. It's like um, if, if, if for some reason we were to, to okay, this is, this is about to get very strange. I think how strange I want to be right now. Okay, I think I'll be a little strange, mildly strange. Um, okay, let's take Santa. Santa seems like fair game. We can pick on Santa. All right, Santa is, is a cultural image. Wouldn't you agree? Very unlikely, if a child was just raised in a cave by wolves, they're going to dream of that specific image, okay? And they're not going to, you know, they finally meet humans and they say, you're not going to believe this thing. I, there's this, I, I've always had this dream since I was a child. There's a fat man. He comes down this little column of bricks and he has a big, big satchel with him, okay? But if we could analyze that child's dreams, they might dream of, of a pattern that would exhibit something like gift giving. That does exist, and that would be an archetype, okay? Or we'd be getting closer to the archetypal realm. And he's saying that human beings, that's not just culture. We all dream, and, ex and the psyche experiences reality as if these things are real. The, the energies and the patterns are real. They just have different cultural faces. I guess that wasn't as weird as I thought it was going to be. Okay, let, let's just take a, an example of um, the God archetype. So the God archetype, first of all, might have various qualities. You don't have to agree with all these, but I'm just saying I'm trying to describe elements of the pattern that exist independent of the various images like Allah or JC or whatever, the Wiccan mother goddess from, from David Foster Wallace's quotation. So things like source, I'm just giving you words that, that tend to describe a pattern here. So words like source means we're hungry for meaning, we're hungry for source. Uh, or consciousness itself, 
consciousness, like, oh, I'm con- like human beings realize they're conscious and they, there's something like, well, the God archetype has a kind of consciousness too. Oftentimes you'll find a sense of unity or wholeness, like, like the God archetype isn't a fragmentation of reality, but some kind of containment of the whole. Okay, here's another one, that something about the God archetype transcends individual human beings or even time. So you would see this across vast stretches of the human experience, this God archetype. And the God archetype, here's where there's a lot of debate, and I don't want to get into it, but the God archetype seems to have values of some sort. Now, that might be dependent, like, on, on different, so let, let's say, tribal realizations of this God or manifestations of this God. They say, our God is really fill in the blank, has this value, not that value. But the, the idea that it has values, that's what I'm saying likes the world to be a certain way and not another way. Make sense? Embedded in the God archetype. Um, and, and this is true, again, across vast amounts of time, that an experience of the God archetype leads to a kind of wonder or awe, or to the unknowable, to the edge of our consciousness. Um, now, there's some debate. I, was, I have, there's a personal dimension, but that there's, I don't know if I, I would go quite so far as to say a personal God, but th- it's personalized in the sense that the human experience can personally be in relationship to it, the God archetype. F- um, the final thing might have something to do with being itself. Like whatever being, the isness of reality, the totality of the isness of reality, of being itself, is part of the pattern of the archetype. Okay, have it made sense with that list? Okay, now I'm going to go to, that's the biggest one I can come up with. I'm going to come up with a smaller version of it. So let's take a values dimension. It seems to be the case that, um, okay, how do I start this? How many feel like, this, this is a show of hands, like I'm, we're back in high school now or whatever, church, you know? It's like, raise your hand if you think sometimes uh, unfair things happen. <sighs> okay. okay, first of all, you would ask, where, where did that come from? Okay, you all agreed, where did it come from? So all kinds of different ways we could explore that. I just want to explore it through the archetype. So one of the things that the king or the tribal leader or something like that was supposed to do and often did do was make judgments. Like the idea of God being on the throne, that's actually a throne of judgment, all right? And that's something that you and I crave. Why? Because you just raised your hand and said, sometimes the world's unfair, okay? I know people say, God is on the throne. I think, yeah, but that's the throne of judgment. (laughs) You know, I don't know if you want to be singing a song about that, all right? (laughs) So in any case, where did that come from? That's the thing we're just we're holding on to in the background. Well, over vast stretches of time, people realize it's kind of difficult to determine what's fair and what's not. And sometimes people don't always agree on what's fair or what's not. So they look to somebody to say, you decide for us what's fair or what's not. And you make judgments. And that's actually most of you know, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. That's most of what the kings did. If you read it carefully, they sat in the throne in the city gate and you came and said, hey, you know, Tim burned down my olive grove again, you know, let's burn him at the stake. And the king would say, I don't know, it's, it's a possibility, and, you know, would go through the thing and then try to judge fairly. Now, here's what's interesting. Human beings, you've probably had this experience, also don't fully trust the king giving the judgments. Because let's say you found out over time that, in fact, the king was making judgments, but it turns out that the kinds of judgments the king was making was also lining the king's pockets. Another word for that is Congress, okay? (laughs) And that makes us upset. And you want to ask, where does that upsetness come from? Do you see how, like, we're working our way back toward what we might call a universal pattern? That then if we start projecting that onto God, so what they did in the ancient world is that the king is subject to God. If not, you're in real trouble. And what they did in Mesopotamia is they brought the king out once a year. They stripped him naked. They marched him through the streets. 
so that everyone knew he's just a human being. They put back on the robes of Marduk, and then he could be the son of God again, and then he would make judgments. So the king has a double meaning, but for the king, it would mean, I better not get ahead of myself here. I'm subject to a greater ideal. Like if you want to, if you're more of a, uh, if you've been more influenced by Plato or Neoplatonic thinking, that's the ideal, okay? So the thing behind the thing. So that, that awakens the God archetype. So God has values and he would like things to be fair and we subject the king to that. Does that make sense? Same with goes with laws or the lawgiver. You just back the thing up and you're getting closer and closer to the notion of the archetype itself. By the way, this is a bit of, bit of an interesting claim. Jung said if, we, if it would be possible to take human beings and completely wipe the, the psyche clean of all gods and goddesses, everything, we just all of a sudden, overnight, we take a pill like in the Matrix and it all goes blank for us. There's no more gods, goddesses, nothing. He said the next day we would spontaneously cook up more. Okay, we just would. That's what he says the religious instinct do. The instinct to meaning is so deep in there that it will bring forth new images. Okay. Did I do point? Yep. I, I did. I just did four and five together and didn't name them as such. Point six. I made it. Now I just want to give you what Jung actually said about the God archetype, and then you can wrestle with it on your own and say, what the heck, what the heck is he talking about? So he says, um, first of all, <laughs> here's a claim he makes, <laughs> that revelation is an experience of the archetype, the God archetype of the deep unconscious. Now, theologians aren't exactly jumping up and down because he's basically saying it's, a, it's an internal experience of unconscious material. But that's interesting in and of itself that, okay, the experience of revelation is the archetype is touching us in some way, and it transforms our conscious awareness. It's revelatory. That's slightly different and why it gives, well, gave certain theologians problems because the, we would like it to be that here I am, John, the writer of revelation, and I'm out on the island, and I got my pen out, and I'm like, okay, God, hit me. You know, and God says, okay, write this, and then here's a good sentence, and it, it kind of comes in like that. Jung is saying, well, no, actually, something of the ego is, dissolves a bit, and deep unconscious patterns come up and confront the psyche. That's revelation. And then the, the lens through which we understand that is cultural. And then I start writing I saw a man in a robe and a sash, and that's the beginning of the book of Revelation. It just happens to look exactly like Caesar, a man in a robe and a sash and a crown. And now, why? Because those are cultural manifestations. But the experience itself is this upwelling of the God archetype. Make sense? That's what he says about Revelation. By the way, I didn't mean, it's funny that I just used the book of Revelation as an example. I just meant the act of a revelatory experience of any kind. I didn't mean he's making a claim about the book Revelation. Anyway, Jungian slip there. All right, number two of this little, little area of uh, number six, um, that archetypes are relative. I think I've already made a case for that. They're, they're just cultural dependent. They can here today, gone tomorrow. Images can lose their power, in other words. Like, I saw an image one time of Jesus saving a goal, and it said, Jesus saves. And I thought, okay, there it is. We, it's lost its power, you know? I mean, how can you possibly take that seriously at, at that point? You know, like, it's just, it's so absurd, okay? All right. Number three here, of my final point, um, that for Jung, the God archetype must contain an element of wholeness or completion. That that's ultimately where this lands. And he said that means the containment of both good and evil. So the God archetype to Jung contains both good and evil. It's not like there's the good God and then there's like the naughty Satan. The whole thing is oriented. The God archetype, as it really sits in the psyche, he says, contains both. And our craving for meaning wants to contain both. That's why evil gives us so much trouble, he says. And why actually good gives us so much trouble. Why do people do this? And we say the God archetype is, is the orientation toward some kind of completeness, some kind of sphere that holds both of these realities. 
shadow, light, good, evil, and every other pole that you can think of, including masculine and feminine. It must be complete. And that rests so deep in the human psyche that it will never go away. We will always, always, always be craving for some kind of completion, even if we don't get it. The craving will still be there. Make sense? Final point here, and this is just for fun. He says, the God archetype is a quaternity instead of a trinity, he says. A quaternity, and he says, what evidence for that? He says it must come in fours. Now, his evidence for that is like several books that are way too long, but it's largely based on things that show up in dreams and myths. But the number four seems to be a number of completion. It's why how, how many directions are there? Okay, north, south, east, west, there we have it. Now, that, that exists across, across time. It's an archetypal pattern. And four is kind of a completion. Like, for example, we say four walls of a house. Why? Because if I said three walls of a house, you'd be like, what? If I built a house with three walls, you would be uncomfortable in it. You would. Even if you're like, oh, I'm all into minimalism. I'm going to minimize a wall, okay? <laughs> no, you would feel like odd. It would feel awkward. And we don't even know why. And Well, Jung is offering a theory as to why, or a model as to why, really. Okay? So the quaternity. So he says the trinity is incomplete, and that's what's giving Christianity so much trouble. And it's large, largely left out the feminine. So he says the assumption of Mary, which the Catholic Church did in the 1960s, which is essentially a divinization of Mary, he said is the first step toward rectifying something that's been dangerously out of balance. And we feel it as a craving. Like, this is, this is, do I want to tell you this story? I do I want to tell you this story. When I first started working for a church a long time ago, Mars Hill um, in Granville, the story of it is, is, is interesting because um, it was started from Calvary Church, which my dad was the pastor of. So in order to start the church, they just adopted all the bylaws and doctrine statements, and away they went, okay? Now, one of them happened to be women can't teach, all right? Women can't teach. You can't have women pastors. They can teach children, but not adults, okay? Now, they really think that through. I mean, so, okay, so adults who don't tend to change their mind and <laughs> don't really want to be challenged... <laughs> No, the, the women can't teach adults, but they can teach children who are open, in, <laughs> more easily influenced. And anyway, they really didn't think that one all the way through. But <laughs> so that, was, that became a debate at the first church I ever worked for. Like, and, and some of us were arguing that for this more inclusive model and whatever. So that became the big debate. And I remember one time saying, uh, 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 someone was saying in this conversation, heated conversation that was taking place, well, next thing you know, we're going to be praying our mother who art in heaven. God is a male. And I just, it just, I was in my early 20s. It just came out of my mouth. I'm going to say something a little bit crass. But just, I just blurted it out. I said, do you think God has a penis? You know? And it was a very awkward moment. <laughs> it was awkward for me, too, because I didn't really think that through. But, you know, and you know what? It changed the whole debate because when the person that paused and said, yes, it, it became so absurd at that moment, you know? It's like, what are we talking about, you know? And anyway, I won't tell you how the rest of the story went. Some of those people moved on and went to a different church. And <laughs> <laughs> My point is, right now with the quaternity stuff, is that Something feels incomplete if it doesn't include the whole. If it doesn't include both masculine and feminine, it's going to keep bothering us. And that's what Jung is saying. That that's the God archetype in work, wanting to include both here and there to be some kind of unity or whole. Have I made sense? Okay. All right, I'm going to end with the David Foster Wallace quote here just, just to keep the pot stirring and then we'll listen to some music and have our final announcements and stuff. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. The compelling reason for maybe choosing something, some sort of God or spiritual type thing, I, I find that sentence funny, or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the four noble truths or some inviolable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much 
anything else you worship will eat you alive. Thanks for listening.